Okay, so um, let's pick up where we left off. Let's first have a look at this worked example and the relative frequencies. So um, like I mentioned before, all you're really going to do is take the frequency, which is already provided, 9, 7, 20, and so on, and then you are going to divide by the total number, which I think you've all calculated is 72. Okay, So the relative frequency of the first class will be 9 out of 72, then 7 out of 72, 20 out of 72, you get the idea, okay? Now to sketch that frequency histogram, I know it takes a while to draw charts, I didn't give you heaps of time, but this is basically what it's going to look like. You can see you've got each of the um, classes there. You could either have drawn in the class um, center, as you can see on this graph, or you could have marked in the beginning and ends of each class, so 45 and then 50, and you would have the bar going between those. So either of them would have been fine. And then you can see the heights there um, represent um, the relative frequency. So that's why the vertical axis, you can see um, they don't go up to like 20 and 30. Um, it goes up to 0 0.4, whatever it happens to be. I'm, I'm not sure what um, 30 out of 72 is actually equal to as a decimal, but you get the idea, okay? So how do we use this to be able to estimate the probabilities? Well, um, we do this just like we did with the dice. Even though this is a continuous random variable, um, you can see I've broken it up into a situation that looks exactly, like this chart looks exactly like, I mean not exactly like, the shape's not the same, but um, the structure of it is the same as when we were looking at the dice. So this might as well be a discrete situation for when I answer these questions. The probability of um, the time of the runner being less than 55, less than or equal to, that is just the first two classes, or I should say the lowest two classes, the 45 to 50, um, and then the 50 to 55. Maybe lowest is not the best way. It's the, it's the fastest, right? They have the shortest time, okay? So all you would do is you would add up 9 over 72 plus 7 over 72, and that'll give you the probability. So uh, what's that? 16 on 72, and you would simplify that if you wanted, okay? Um, conversely, the probability of um, the time, the runner's time being greater than or equal to 60, uh, instead of taking the two fastest classes, here I'm taking the two slowest classes. So the 60 to 65 class and the 65 to 70 class. And then finally, you've got the, uh, the one in the middle there, the probability of being between 50 and 65. So that's the middle three classes, okay? Now, like I mentioned before, this is taking a continuous random variable and basically sort of in imposing a discrete structure on it. Like there's a discrete number, a distinct number of classes, and then you can treat each one independ independently, individually, and add up the probabilities as you need. But the whole point of this topic, and it's gonna take us till the end of the term to really explore this, is to say, well, can't we work out a way to treat continuous random variables in a continuous way? Is there a way that I can solve these problems, work out probabilities, make predictions, um, without resorting to my discrete tools um, and my discrete structures, can I treat them continuously? Okay, so let's return back to this graph that we had for the heights of people in the class. Okay, this probability density function. If what I want is the probability between two particular boundaries, a lower boundary and an upper boundary, as most of you connected before, I'm trying to work out an area under a curve. And we have all of the knowledge developed over the last couple of months to be able to do this. This is an integral, isn't it? This is the whole point of actually putting integral calculus between all that statistics we learned and now, right? We needed integral calculus to be able to handle these areas, yeah? So what I can say is the probability, if it's equal to the area under the curve, then the probability is equal to the integral between those two relevant boundaries underneath this function. So the probability is given by the integral from A to B of this function, f of x, where f of x is whatever probability density function that you like, okay? Now, I'd like you to make that heading, probability density functions, because um, that's what we're now gonna focus on, okay? Now, probability density functions, um, the f of x that we, that we choose, they really can be all different kinds of things. So, for example, we had, you know, this is the kind of shape that I gave you of the heights, um, but that, that sort of dice situation before, it looked more like this, right? It was lower, it was more symmetrical. Uh, you might have weird other kinds of continuous random variables that do this, right? There's no reason why you can't have data that behaves like this. And so, all you need to do is pick a function that is appropriate to that, right? Except that you can't just pick any function. Because this is a probability function, um, there are a couple of conditions that need to be satisfied, right? So let's first jot down, right? We want to have this result that we are working out probabilities between certain boundaries. We're working these out by way of an integral. So a to b 
f of x, okay? If this is the case, that we use this integral to work out the probability, then there are two conditions that you must satisfy if you want to be a probability density function, okay? Um, two conditions. So what are those conditions? Well, firstly, when we think about situations, right, if something is likely to happen, then it has a probability that's close to 1, right? If something is certain, it has a probability of 1. Um, if something is unlikely to happen, it has a probability close to 0, and if it cannot possibly happen, then its probability is equal to zero, right? Um, what you can't ever have is a probability that's negative, yeah? Um, probabilities go from zero to one, inclusive, okay? So what we're saying therefore is your function, your probability density function, it must be greater than or equal to zero because you can't have a negative probability. Does, does that make sense? Okay, so that's the first condition. Um, which, as you can see, you're like, wait a second, a lot of functions I know, um, they, they go negative. Well, we'll come to solving that problem in a second. That's the first thing. And then the second is, remember we said when we were looking at the dice, without any calculation, when I asked you, what's the probability between 2 and 12, you all could say, without adding up all of the bars and all the, the values, you could say it's equal to 1, because that's what the total probability of any situation is equal to. How would we express that? How would we articulate that fact that all your total probabilities are equal to 1 using the language of integral calculus? Well, this integral, number 1, has to include everything. Right? It has to include everything, which means you go from as far left as you possibly can, negative infinity, to as far right as you possibly can, to positive infinity. When you integrate that function, if that function really does give you probabilities, then they should total all of the probabilities possible they should total to be equal to 1, okay? So um, what we're saying here is your total, um, your total situation um, must add up to 1 because otherwise you've missed something, right? If you're like, oh, I added up all my probabilities and they're up to 0 0.99, um, they, that means you're missing something, right? So this actually has sort of a sub-implication, okay? The fact that um, your probabilities have to add up to 1, um, this causes us a bit of an issue. Um, if, for example, we go back to this weird-looking graph over here, right? You don't need to draw this, but you can if you want, right? Um, you can see here that suppose, right, I have um, this section that I've drawn, and I'm just going to put some boundaries in here, let's say from here to here. Suppose this area under this curve equals to 1, okay? But if you've got, like, this maybe was like a weird polynomial, which had, I don't know, it's got six, you know, six? It's got five stationary points, so maybe this is like an x to the power of 6 type function, okay? Um, we know that there's like other parts of this function. It doesn't just like stop existing. Um, it might go down here. It might like wave around and do other things over here. Or, or this might skyrocket off to infinity. So you're going to have other parts of the function which like you kind of don't want to really deal with because if you included them, your total integral wouldn't add up to 1. Okay, so how do we get around this, right? What we do is we define f of x um, in a particular way. What we do is we say, look, um, this particular function that's sort of helpful to us, its shape is useful to us, um, we will let the probability density function equal this particular function, um, but only between the values that we're interested in. So if I want to go from A to B, right, then I say you're equal to this function um, between A and B. And supposing that between A and B, you're, you add up all of that area and you equal to 1, then I don't want any more area to be added, right, or subtracted for that matter. So everywhere else, I say that that function, our probability density function, is just 0, okay? Um, if you are less than your lower boundary, or if you are uh, greater, I shouldn't include the boundary there, um, if you're greater than your upper boundary, everywhere else except inside here, you just let your probability density function equal zero, okay? So what that means is it's, it has the practical effect of ignoring um, these parts of the function that if you included them into your integral, uh, it wouldn't add up to one, okay? So I know that's a bit tricky, like it's very um, symbol and, and notation heavy. So if you're looking at this and thinking, uh, my brain hurts, okay, um, that's, that's understandable. I know that this is very new to you and I promise with time you'll become more comfortable with it, okay? But basically where we're gonna head from here is uh, the first things we're gonna think about are what functions can be probability density functions and what ones can't, right? What characteristics do they have? So we're gonna explore that next lesson. 
Um, well done on wrapping your head around this. I know it's complicated and new, but it's because um, this is such a powerful lens for looking at the world. And that's why when you take statistics and you take calculus and you combine them, it ends up being um, immensely useful for a variety of practical situations, which we'll get to later. Okay, well done everyone. See you next lesson.